All right, everyone. Um, we are still one member short of a quorum. Oh, oh yeah. Ah, oh, great. <laughs> well, we're ready to go then. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we have a number of other school board members who are on the way but had conflicts and are going to be a little bit late today. Um, so, uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Yes, uh, Mr. Ankuma. Aye. Ms. Gill. Aye. Mr. Reiter. Here. And Ms. Ward. Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Um, I'd ask unanimous consent for approval of the agenda. Seeing no objections, it is approved. The first item we have on the close on the agenda today is a closed meeting. I um, do we have a estimate on how long it will take? Uh, roughly 15 minutes. Roughly 15 minutes, so it shouldn't be too long. Um, would someone please uh, read us into closed? Well. Do they move it up? Try to find it. <clears throat> yes. Sorry. I can probably do it. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> Pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose, to discuss or consider the identified subject matter, personnel under section 2.2-377-AI, in particular staff appointments, staff reassignments, staff resignations, staff retirements, staff performance, staff change of position, disciplining of a specific employee, child care leave, family medical leave, EPED assignments, and advisory committee appointments and resignations. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we are going into closed. We should be back shortly. Thank you. Could I have a motion to read us back into open, please? This one's short. Uh, I move that the board reconvene to open meeting. Thank you. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Could someone please certify the closed meeting? Uh, whereas the Falls Church City Public School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-377B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church City Public School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirement by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convened in the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Ms. Gill. Second? Second. Mr. Ankuma? Aye. Mr. Castillo? Aye. Ms. Gill? Aye. Mr. Reiter? Yes. And Ms. Ward? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to the consent agenda. Uh, public comment. Oh, sorry. I'm, thank you very much. Okay. That takes us to public comment. Um, the, in accordance with the school board bylaw 2.3, time for each speaker is limited to three minutes. Additional written, written statements may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to board members and for the record. So uh, we have a number of requests. The first person up is... Uh, Mr. Kelly, if you could come up and please state your name and address for the record. Hello, my name is Farrell Kelly and I live at 600 Roosevelt Boulevard um, here in Falls Church. But today, instead of speaking as an individual, I'm speaking as president of the Falls Church City Education Association. Um, I'm not speaking to a particular item on tonight's agenda, but I wanted to let uh, the school board know and the community um, that uh, the Education Association uh, took a poll of its members and voted uh, to publicly support uh, the bond referendum um, for the rebuilding of George Mason. Um, FCCA realizes that uh, as a community and as a school system, um, you know, the, the, all the links matter and that where GM is hurting, um, that hurts uh, all of us and so uh, in order to keep our school system strong um, and our staff uh, uh, safe and our students safe 
um, we uh, actively and, and fully support um, the bond referendum and we hope that the community will decide to pass it. Um, and we thought based on some of the uh, discussion at the um, debate by the League of Women Voters, held by the League of Women Voters, in which uh, it was mentioned that um, the community didn't have word on how teachers uh, felt about this, that um, we wanted everybody to know that our educators um, think that this is what's best uh, for students, for the community, for staff, and um, for Falls Church. So uh, thank you for listening and having me here tonight. And um, I'm going to go take care of some other things. Chris Kelly. Thank you. The next public comment is Ms. Brady, please. Hi, my name is Beth Brady and I live at 200 North Spring Street. I have a letter that is from my daughter, so I'm not quite sure how we would do you want to read it? I, I have one and she has one. So I would I don't have to read hers, I could just present it or give it to whoever could read it. If you could give both to us, that would be great okay. and make your statement. So I just wanted to speak on behalf of Mr. Jamie Lee, and he has worked with both of my kids over the last five years. Sorry. I'm not a good public speaker. <laughs> Mr. Lee has been a wonderful leader and mentor to both of them. He has encouraged them and assisted them with projects and classwork. He allows them to come into his room and eat lunch and bond with other kids. He, works with, he worked with my son, who is very shy and introverted. He encouraged and motivated him to be his best. Mr. Lee also helped guide my son with his SAT and ACT prep and college preparations. Mr. Lee helped create the Hydroponic Club. This was the first for George Mason and allowed children to explore and consider environmental careers. We considered ourselves to be lucky to have such a great teacher to work with our kids. He is a great asset to George Mason. We live in the city that cares so much about our kids and community, and Mr. Lay is the model exactly what we want for our children. We are truly grateful for Mr. Lay and very disappointed that he's not present at George Mason High School and would love to see him back. Thank you very much. The next public comment is from Ms. Leach. Hi, I'm uh, Gina Leach. I'm um, at 514 North Oak Street, and I'm uh, speaking um, on behalf of my uh, son, Ian Leach, and her son, Jacob Brady. They put together a video from college there at Radford University, thanks to Jamie Lay. And, uh, and uh, so you can see it online at, on a YouTube video. Um, supporting Jamie Lay. And I'm just going to read an excer excerpt from uh, the video on behalf of them. Um, Jamie Lay has had a positive impact on many students' lives. We, Ian Leach and Jacob Brady, are prime examples of kids whose lives have changed for the better due to Jamie's role as our teacher. And we are now at Radford University. From the eyes of his students, Jamie Lay is a determined, hardworking man who is willing to go above and beyond to help his students succeed in as many ways as possible. He encouraged his students to be independent in school and ready for college. Jamie is a friend to his students as well as parents who appreciate Jamie's hard work, effort, and determination that he puts into his students. If anything, we need more teachers like Jamie Lay, not less. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next public comment is Mr. Kutchma. Uh, Dave Kuchma, A13 Fulton Avenue. <clears throat> I'm here to uh, speak on behalf of Jamie Lay. I wanted to preface my words with uh, stating that I have had three graduates that have gone through George Mason High School and have, uh, have been involved with Mr. Lay um, from time to time, but our experience is about a decade through, uh, through the high school. We've been in Falls Church about 15 years. 
And speaking on behalf of Jamie, and uh, we got to know him a, a fair amount of time ago, that it's just a rare occasion when you get a teacher that has the wisdom at a, at a very young age to, to get a grasp on what children need. And these are, in particular, children that have challenges, that may have learning disabilities, and they're in a high school that is a very you know, challenging environment for them to go to and to be successful. Uh, Jamie was the kind of person that somehow, some way, could reach these kids and, you know, I use the words and you'll hear it again, mentor, leader. Um, uh, but I, but I want to say that Jamie represented a safe harbor for countless kids that have come through George Mason High School. I guess it's his room, it's during lunch, um, do you have to go into a cafeteria and face up to um, the challenges of having uh, kids that, are, that may pick on you or that may you know, belittle you? It was him, it was his room, the kids were there. He took care of them, he guided them, and he made them, as well as their parents, be, have, a, have a successful experience. So I'm just here to convey that, that, that Jamie has, you know, he has saved kids, he's facilitated uh, their future and their lives. So how many kids have actually gone on to higher education because of him? Uh, it's, it, it's a rarity. So I just wanted to say that, um, you know, as a dad, a father, uh, on behalf of my children and those that he has served, that, uh, that you take that into consideration with whatever you guys do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuchma. The next comment is from Allison Kutchma. Ms. Kutchma. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Allison Kutchma, and I live at 813 Fulton Avenue. And I just wanted to come here tonight to speak to you uh, in support of Jamie Lay. Um, I first met Jamie, and I believe it was in 2009. For those of you who have been through the high school at those little mini conferences, at those little tiny desks at the, in the in the gym, and uh, it was clear that he was somebody different that he clearly cared and, and I felt like in the conversation that he would take care of my son um, at a time when George Mason uh, was really a shadow of what it is today in terms of what it pr provides for students with learning disabilities. Uh, at that time, uh, the school did not even have a co-teach algebra class. Um, and so we were trying to uh, trail blaze, uh, blaze in that environment. And, and he was uh, himself a leader and showed great courage um, to support students. Um, and I don't know if you know, but uh, to be a special education teacher, you know, you have to be certified in your content area. And do you think you get paid extra because you handle all that paperwork and, and all of that you don't? And, and so it's, it's an exceptional treasure to have a man like that in our school. Um, you know, I, I trust him with my children and with guiding them. Um, and he's, been he's become a friend to our family and to my children as now that they're adults. Um, I kind of think about him as, you know, how there's been Harvey and Irma, and those are 100-year storms and 500-year storms. I would say in, in all the teachers that I have met, um, Jamie Lay is like a 100-year storm. Um, he is so exceptional and he is so rare um, that his qualities are just, you, you just don't believe it's true. And he cares about kids and um, at a time in their life which is incredibly impactful. Um, many kids come into the high school in, in a 14-year-old you know, body with you know, a 10-year-old or 12-year-old brain. And, and all, you know, they're disorganized and they're shy and introverted and, you know, they don't know how to ask a girl to the eighth grade dance and, and, and his room afforded a, a safe haven. And it helped kids uh, literally survive uh, their days at George Mason High School. And I know um, that I will be forever grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kutchma. That is all of the people who turned in forms requesting public comment. Is there anyone else who wishes to make public comment? Please come up. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Angela Newburn. I live at 212 Garden Court. My daughter has had an IEP since first grade. She goes to a very rigorous school at George Mason. She's a senior. 
Finding out that Jamie Lay, her caseworker, wasn't there this year was devastating. She is on the runway for college right now. She needs to get IEP, she needs accommodations for SATs, ACTs, for special applications to colleges, not just the regular common apps. Jamie Lay has been a teacher and she has been in his classroom since her freshman year. He has, not only for her, but all of his students, he offers to meet with them before school, after school, during Mustang block, during lunch, at any time that those kids can find time, he will find the time to sit and work with them individually. In the 12 years in this school district, there has not been a single educator who has put in the time of the commitment for my kid. I have no idea why he is on leave. There's been no talk, obviously. It's part of the closed session. But as a parent in the community of a child who has had the benefit of working with one of the best educators that you have, I would highly just ask you to review your decision on how this is going to play out because he is a valuable resource in this community. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Are there any additional people who wish to make public comment? Hi, I'm Linda Kamel. I'll make it short, just three minutes. I wrote a little, a, a few notes. <coughs> <clears throat> okay, um, if author Franz Kafka were here today with us, he would be inspired to write another book entitled The Good Teacher. <coughs> In it, Kafka would write about a kind and dedicated man who, besides being a good teacher, was also a good role model, a good influence, a good guide to many of our students. One of those students is my son, <coughs> Adrian, who has benefited from a great team project in aquaponics, which, by the way, won national awards as well as recently the 2017 Presidential Environmental Education Award at the EPA. Most recently, the Washington Post featured an article about the hydroponics project at Mason. Because of his positive experience with Mr. Lay, Adrian is now considering marine biology in college. <clears throat> Congratulations are due to Mr. Lay, who unfortunately was not able to attend the awards at the EPA because of this very issue. I worked for the IMF for 27 years, and we have a lot of rules. In that time, I have seen similar things happen to good people, but these were misunderstandings by people who were going a little bit further to help someone and then were caught in a system, which was all wrong. I don't know the details of this case, but I know in my heart that whatever it is, <clears throat> it is a misunderstanding and should be dropped now. The embodiment of a good teacher is Jamie Lay, who should be held in high esteem for all the good work he has done and the students he has helped na navigate the difficult years of high school. We should be thanking him for the lives he has changed, not dragging him through this Kafkaistic bad dream. We are asking that you clear Mr. Lay's good name and that you restore his position at the school. We care for him, we need him, and mostly the students miss him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any additional people who wish to make public comment? Uh, I'd like to say something. That's okay. Kind of hiding, but. Um, I didn't prepare anything, um, but my name is Jason Kuchma, um, and, uh, and Jamie changed my life. Um, when I was in high school, uh, I pretty much was terrible at everything, um, and I got poor grades, and, uh, and I just, I wasn't in an environment where I could succeed. And uh, that's not the case for very many people, but for a few people, um, it, it really hits you. And so um, Jamie was someone that provided an environment where, you know, I could figure out the way that I learn. And in high school, I struggled to get through a single book over the course of a year. And you know, don't tell anyone, but I don't think I got through a book <laughs> in high school. And now, 
um, I have the confidence to to succeed because he came in uh, on the weekends to help me. You know, he scheduled his own time, and and there are a lot of motivations that people, you know, do things. And you know, someone that was just there because he liked watching people succeed and watching people grow um, is something that's special. And now that I'm 21, uh, I never went to college, my bedside table is full of books. And I read almost every day. And the only reason why I do anything um, is because of Jamie. And, and that's the truth. Because of Jamie, I could see that I could actually you know, function in society. And, and, and he, he provided the way of all those things that, that you really need to be able to do what you love. And now I do what I love every single day. And I, I know that I'm not the only one who gets to really experience life to the fullest because of Jamie. And so I wish that you guys would, would really consider that. Um, but I know Jamie almost better than anyone. And I know that, that he'll end up in a place that deserves him. And I hope you guys uh, consider that. So thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to provide public comment? Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, we will now move on to the next item in the agenda. So I will turn the gavel over to Chairman Webb. Uh, thank you, Mr. Reininger. I um, apologize for running from being late this evening. I was returning from um, Southern Virginia. Um, I had a family member who <coughs> passed away and their funeral service was today. So just getting back in town. Um, so I have to call yes. okay. All right. Uh, so we'll move on to the to the ask unanimous consent for approval of the consent agenda. And so moved. All right. And then move on to uh, 6.01 VSBA Academy Awards. Yeah, so um, each year um, the Virginia School Boards Association um, sends out recognition to our school, school board members for a number of different things. Um, and there are uh, for professional development and for um, work in the community. And so this evening um, the chair will be handing out to our school board members their VSBA awards and recognitions. And after they come out we would like to get a quick photo with all of you and your certificates. So I'll turn it over to you. I will pass those out. I will actually you know, what we'll do, I guess being that we're gonna do a, a quick photo, so as I call you, if y'all come on over in front, we'll do the <laughs> we'll do the picture. So uh, Mr. Ankuma. Yes. All around. <laughs> uh, Ms. Gill. Uh, Dr. Noonan. And myself, so I won't call you. <laughs> and Ms. Ward. So take it out. Okay. You're going to hold it up. <laughs> Let's get in there. Look at me. All right, ladies. I don't have my camera in there. You would pull your You didn't know there was such a momentous occasion. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, but it's a good looking bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to move on to.
Business Action and Information, uh, 7.1 Student Achievement Snapshot. Dr. Newman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight with you. Um, we have an opportunity this evening to hear a little bit about um, student achievement in our school division um, as it stands currently. Um, just as a, a little bit of a a learning for me and perhaps a bit of a backstory to help set the stage for this evening. It's my understanding that in the past there have been evenings that have been state of the schools evenings where uh, the principals have come and they've spoken about their data to the school board and um, as I sort of unpacked that a little bit and coming from another division that had similar state of the schools evenings um, I thought to myself that uh, if principals were coming and spending a half an hour talking about data that they might not necessarily get to um, talking about some of the really cool things that are happening in their schools or being responsive to the needs that they have seen from the data. Um, so this year we're, we've readjusted, um, not readjusted, we've adjusted the schedule a little bit to do a preliminary data walk this, mor or this evening um, that Lisa High, along with Jeannie Seabridge, will be uh, working through um, to give you a broad picture of how we are doing division-wide with respect to some of the data points that are out there. And then we'll hold um, state of the schools um, evenings with our principals, but instead of having them all come together, we thought we'd break them out so that you'd have a better chance to see them. So we'll do the elementaries one night, Mary Ellen Henderson one night, and George Mason another night. So you get a better chance to sort of dig in around um, the work that they are all doing in, this, in, uh, in their schools, and we'll do those during, um, during regular school board meetings. So, um, with that, in, in just a second, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Uh, Lisa and Jeannie have worked really hard on, on this presentation. i um, excited that they're going to be able to share it with you. Um, there is some information, and, and I'm going to, by saying it, I'm probably going to set it up um, in a way that it's just going to create havoc, perhaps. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, uh -oh. Not havoc. <laughs> but, uh, let, me, let me just say this. There is some information in here about our enrollment. And I'm sharing that with you because tonight is not the night to talk about enrollment. We will be sharing enrollment information with you um, as soon as we have the final adjusted numbers. But there is some preliminary information in here about enrollment. So as you're looking at it, I would encourage you just to kind of keep that in mind that this is preliminary information about enrollment. But the hope is that you'll really focus in on where we are. Um, my belief is that we should be telling the whole story. Um, not just parts of the story. So tonight you're going to see the good, you're going to see the not so good, and you're going to see some ugly, the good, the bad, and the ugly um, of where we are. And I think it's important for us to recognize that and to understand where our areas of growth are. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, Jeannie Seabridge is our division testing director. Um, so she has the best sense of where we are. She's pulled a lot of these data together for us, um, but she and Lisa together are going to share our data journey um, to date with you. So, Mr. Chair, if it's okay with you, I'll turn it over to Lisa. Yep. And it, just before you get started, I was just informed that there was one additional parent who had public comments, so I'm going to allow for that one person to to speak for three minutes, and then I'm going to turn it back over to, to Lisa and Ms. Seabridge. All right, remember that whole setup. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm sorry, I'm a little late. Okay. So my name is Jill Friend, and I live at 155 West Annandale Road in Falls Church. Um, so basically, I'm here to express my support for Mr. Jamie Lay. Um, my daughter has worked with Mr. Lay in different capacities um, since ninth grade. Um, he was her biology co-teacher in ninth grade. In tenth grade, he was really a um, friend and mentor helping her in chemistry and then in 11th grade he was a caseworker um, and this year obviously he's not there um, basically what makes Jamie very very unique amongst all of the special educators that we have experienced um, is his ability to connect to the students and inspire them to reach their full potential um, he sees each student as an individual and with patience and humor encourages them to persevere even when they want to give up. He has never wavered in his commitment to encourage my daughter to do her best. Um, in addition, for students with ADHD and processing disabilities, Mr. Lay has the ability to teach in a hands-on, clear, reinforcing manner that results in high achievement 
And this was seen especially um, in my daughter's chemistry class in, um, I guess it was 10th grade, where he made chemistry really easy for her to understand, a very, very difficult subject. Um, he's also exceptional in that he is able to think out of the box to come up with solutions that meet each individual's learning style. My daughter is a pretty high achieving student, and we um, have been facing this issue where there really isn't an appropriate math class for her within the school system after taking Algebra 2 in 10th grade, because all the other classes are either IB and AP. And uh, Jamie has really helped us with an ongoing dialogue with the administration, which is still not resolved yet, but he has helped. Uh, he was my advocate in trying to push to find a math class for her after Algebra 2 so she, continu she could continue with her math um, in 11th and 12th grade. Um, and finally, and equally important, Jamie has been a strong ally and nurturing presence for my daughter over the years. In moments of high stress, he has provided a safe haven for her to go to and decompress. He is, a he is a trusted resource, and he is a trusted friend, and he has basically made high school safe and nurturing for my daughter um, when, when she's faced with, with the stress of uh, academics within the school system. So um, I just want to conclude um, by saying that teaching for Mr. Lay has been a passion, not just a job. Um, my daughter right now, um, there's not a day that goes by when she does not talk about how she misses Mr. Lay. He's exceptional um, in both his teaching style. He finds a way to uh, meet each individual where they are, not in a box, and help them reach their full potential. Um, and also, he's a friend and a trusted ally that makes high school um, safe for the students. So. Um, by that, I hope you do um, reconsider reinstating Mr. Lay's employment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Fran. Well, turn it back over to Ms. High and Ms. Seabridge. Okay. Thank you all for indulging. Tonight, you will hear about um, various programs that our students are able to access to meet their needs and their interests, um, and the data supporting um, around those programs. You have the. You're the clicker, I think. For example, we have, we'll be sharing information on our CTE credentialing. You'll hear information about the Virginia Department of Education, SOLs, IB, AP, and then our EIP program. Um, before, what's not on the, uh, the slide that I do want to um, share that we see as an accomplishment of the board, and that is um, hiring Dr. Noonan as our superintendent. Um, when he came in in May, he hit the ground running, and it's just been a really good year for us. And, you know, as the teachers at Convocation and as we've gone through the school year, um, it's, just, it's just really been a really good and po promising year for us, and we're just excited to have him as our division leader. Um, other data that we will be sharing with you tonight uh, are... Um, the Virginia Department of Education awarded the school division the Board of Education Excellence Award. Um, all four of our schools, Mount Daniel, Thomas Jefferson, MEH, and George Mason, all received the Ex Education Distinguished Achievement Award um, for 2017. We are now one of seven IB school divisions in the nation. Um, which, which is a great honor, and that's something that we're working on to make sure that we're addressing um, IB so that every student can access all of the, the components of the IB um, program. Um, we are the highest in reading, writing, and history for um, the, the state in SOL pass rates this year. We're the highest for pass rate in math in Northern Virginia, and we're fifth in the state. Um, and our graduation rate is 99.5, 100%. We, we kind of keep going back and forth with the state um, um, on that number. Um, but when you speak with our administrators and counselors at the high school, we graduated every student. Um, and at the end of the school year, we had 16 National Merit commended students and one student who was a um, National Merit finalist. And that's, we're really proud of the work that our students do on a daily basis. Um, another early inter inter 
identification program, which is EIP, is through George Mason University. Um, and this program is geared for <coughs> students who will be the first student in their family to go off to college. Um, and last year we graduated um, six students <coughs> from that program. And of those six, three went on to four-year universities, two went to Northern Virginia Community College, and one um, entered the Marines. Um, this year we have six students who are in our EIP prep program where they are as eighth graders going on Saturdays and getting some extra <coughs> assistance and then currently 9 through 12 we have 22 students who are participating in our EIP program. Um, this summer we sent five students to um, governor school in the areas of you'll see you see there humanities, math, science, technology, um, world language, dance, and Spanish. And another thing that we're really proud of with the Virginia Department of Ed Education, they have had us work on careers, and we had 149 um, students who received um, CTE credentials. One of them would be in our finance and economics um, area, and then a few were in the television production, computer science, and graphics. Um, but that's just really having students receive access for things that they're interested in, careers as they move forward. One of the things that we've also would like to share with you is that we have a lot of students at MEH who are accessing our high school um, credits. Um, in our mathematics, we have 178 middle schoolers who are taking math for credit, high school credit, 213 who are taking World Civ I for credit, that's our eighth graders, and then 292 are World Language credit. And with that, there could be some seventh graders, some eighth graders, so our students are really, really doing well. Um, and as they move on to high school, we'll have, you know, we'll be working to make sure that we have things to meet their needs there. But I just think that's something we should be commended for. Enrollment, this is where Dr. Noonan said he has set us up. Um, and all of these are based on September 30th um, dates. Um, numbers. And you can see that we've grown over the, the last five years. Um, our 930-2017 is an unaudited. This, we have to submit that to the state in the next week or so and they will come back with a, with a final. But right now we're at 2693 um, and we, we, the growth that we expected isn't quite there but we're seeing that some of that, ha some of that lack of growth was at kindergarten um, this year which you know, with, with Mount Daniel and all that's going on, um, that may prove to be an okay thing um, as we have to have it stay at a certain number. Um, but you can see every year we grow. Keep going to the, go to the next one. And this is the historical enrollment information that has been provided over, over the years. And you'll just see that for the most part, our, the red is our actual where we are every year and we're a little bit below projections this year but in every school division every building we did grow in the number of students who are there except for Mount Daniel yes all right where did our journey take us? Um, tonight you will hear us um, talk about all students, but you'll also hear us speak about our special populations, and those will be our students with disabilities, our economically disadvantaged, and our L's. Um, you will see out of 2,672 students, we have um, 365 who are students with disabilities, 212 are economically disadvantaged, and that's our free and reduced lunch, um, students who receive free and reduced lunch. And then our L's are second language, and there are 228 students throughout the school division out of 2,676. And you'll see our percentages are 13, 7, and 8.5 percent. So just keep that in perspective as we go through. Um, another piece that we wanted to share with you is our Every December we have to provide to the VDOE our December um, count. And this is as of December 16th because we haven't reached December 7, 2017, that, that date is not here. So this comparison when you see the growth is from a December 2015 count to December 16th which was last year. Um, you'll, you'll notice we've broken it down by schools. Um, and when you look at the disability category, it's the areas where um, there are higher need areas that um, our students have, the, the numbers have grown in our developmentally delayed intellect, intellectual disabilities. Um, but that's just information just so you can understand the students that we're working, working with and just understanding even though a lot of times we hear that that's a small population but every last student counts and we want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of each and every one of them. 
All right, this is a complicated <laughs> sort of chart for our um, English learner, learner numbers. Um, you'll see when you look at the total, currently for this school year we are servicing 136 students who are either level one through level 4.3 as far as their WIDA score. Um, total of ELs in the division are 242, but you'll see that from exit one through four, we have 106 students who have exited. Um, when you look below in the writing, there are 18 different languages spoken by our L's. Um, we have students, we've shown you the numbers for students who are dual, dual identified, who are both students with disabilities or English language learners. Um, and you'll see three out of, of 106 of our students who've ex exited are dual identified and gifted an L. And that's one of the things that we worked um, with our advisory committee last school year to look for ways to make sure that we were identifying students who may be in underrepresented populations. And we will continue that work um, with our teachers and our advisory committee um, this year as well. Um, our, this is, this, when you look, when you go to the um, Virginia Department of Education website, they have a new look in terms of what the school report card will look like. It's called the School Quality Profiles, and this is our front page that gives just a snapshot of what happens throughout the, um, the entire school division. Um, and you can, you can actually look at any school division as well as individual schools as well. Um, and it's, it's an open document for the, the public. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Jeannie to give you more specifics on um, our scores. Okay, so um, just wanna preface that when you look at numbers and you look at the data that there's a lot behind it that you have to keep in in mind so it's really not the number on the surface but there's a lot of things that may have impacted scores one way or the other so while we're looking at this this is our SOL English reading score and this is for the division so third grade um, through high school and we use some color coding here to make <coughs> it a little bit easier to understand but it is a three-year trend so the blue means that we showed growth in that area and if there's a red it means that there may have been a dip so looking at this chart right here even though we stayed the same as we did last year with the 64 percent pass rate for economically disadvantaged it's in red because it's below the state so if you look at the blue column on the right that's the state pass rate was at 67 percent pass rate and Falls Church for economic disadvantage is at, at 64. However, if you look at the other three um, areas, students with disabilities, English learners, and all students, we are, are above the pass. And you'll notice this year that we really are focusing on those subgroup populations. So you'll see that with all students, we have our economic disadvantage, English learners, and students with disabilities. And um, one reason being um, it fits in with our priorities for the school board work plan that Ms. High is going to talk about a little bit more later. For the SOO English in writing, you'll notice all the areas for this year are in blue. So we have shown growth with all of our subgroup populations as well as with all students. We are well above the state pass rate in those areas as well. And you'll notice that there are some areas that jumped quite a lot. If you look at our English language learners, um, that's a definite jump. And you'll see a trend here with our English learners as well that they're probably doing better than um, the other subgroups. There's a lot of factors, some of the research-based programs that have been put in place with those kids, extra time after school with them. Uh, we got, we counted our exit one and um, exit two students were counted into the um, pass rate this year as well. Plus VGLA last year, we had about 12 students taking the VGLA assessment for reading. And out of those 12, 10 of them passed. And the VGLA is no longer available, so we, we, we'll take it for last year. So with the SOL mathematics pass rate, you'll, you'll notice that as far as all students go, we stayed pretty much the same, even though we're still above the state. Econ economic disadvantage, we are below the state average. English learners were neck and neck <laughs> with the state, and we did increase. And then our student disabilities um, are still above the state, but um, just one little point dip right there. There's been a lot of work with mathematics in the last year too, develop, um, realigning to the new standards. Scope and sequence has been developed with our math specialist Jen Fesident and teachers across the division have been working really hard on that. So we're, we're hoping to see a, um, an increase next year a little bit. SOL history and social sciences. We have again that red economic disadvantaged um, population whereas everybody else either showed growth or pretty much stayed the same when it comes to our history 
and our SOL science. We can see that there's a little bit more red here than we want to see. Uh, so we had a lot of conversation about this. We really feel that we need to sit down and take a look at our curriculum and our alignment with our standards that we'll be teaching and, and doing a little bit of a crosswalk and just digging a little deeper into this because there's some factors that uh, we need to take a look at. The other thing is keeping in mind that this isn't apples to apples, it's apples to oranges. So the cohort from the previous year who took the assessment aren't the same kids. So we, we definitely need to do some work on that. One of the other pieces before you go to the next slide with the um, SOL for Science, um, the state has gone into removing some of the actual multiple choice SOL tests. And for science, our third grade students in previous years were taking a multiple multiple choice test. Now it's just fifth graders, so our students from K through five, they're being access, assessed in fifth grade for our science as well, and that's a little bit of a different because it's, it used to be two, two scores um, that would have been average, so that's something that we want to look at, and we're continuing to work on um, some of the problem-based assessments that teachers are using to identify mastery in third and fourth grade. Mm -hmm. So again, there's a lot of things that kind of play with these numbers. It's not just surface value. And as far as the SOLs, that was it. So we're going to take another look here. This is our story with data. So what went well on our journey and where did we hit some bumps in the road? We saw a few there. Um, some things here that we're looking at. This is for, we tried to include all schools. So this is for Jesse Thackeray Preschool. Um, Liz Germer supplied this chart with us. Their assessment that they use is the PALS assessment, which is a statewide assessment. It, it's in a way, it's their SOL for um, early elementary school. Uh, Mount Daniel uses as well, and so do some grade levels at um, Thomas Jefferson. And what we're seeing here is in all of the ranges, uh, the kids are scoring fairly well in the 100%, 90%, 80% um, range on, on those assessments. And then she also teased it out with students with disabilities and, and the at-risk population and tuition. <coughs> And we'll look at Mount Daniel. There's is a little different as far as the chart goes, only because they have a little bit more data over, over the years that they can compare it with. So if we're looking at all students in kindergarten, pretty much you know right up there in the 97% um, percent range, and first grade's doing really well as well. So a lot of blue, a lot of blue there. So they've seen a lot of change. I like to look at the one in the middle, the LIEP. LIEP, by the way, is for our replacement for ESOL. So if you haven't heard yet, um, with the new ESSA guidelines, we it's not ESOL anymore. It is now the LEAP program or, or the Language Instructional Educational Program. So if you see LEAP and wonder what we're talking about, that's what that means. And then students with disability, again, they had a nice, you know, nice gain with the PALS at Mount Daniel. And then we're looking at TJ. So we're back to the standards of learning again, since they do the standards of learning test starting in third grade. And looking at their ranges um, as far as reading for third, fourth, and fifth grade, they're, they're doing well across the board. Again, we're even seeing our, our subgroup populations are doing fairly well. Um, we look at benchmark literacy. Um, that's been put in place, guided reading, uh, approach the um, writer's um, writing program that we, we just added uh, last year, right? Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of things that, that have been put in place that really we think are helping our kids. And of course, mm -hmm. our fabulous teachers that we have. So math is an area that we have seen across the board. Um, and we mentioned that a little bit you know, earlier with the whole division data that there are there's a few little dips, but really it's about aligning those standards because we have new standards and we'll start testing on those standards next school year. For history, we have the Virginia Studies, which is just fourth grade who does the history SOL. And as Ms. High mentioned, the state's been getting rid of some of those SOLs. So third grade used to have one, they don't anymore. So really it's just fourth grade and fifth grade also doesn't have the SOL. They have the um, PBAs that they have to do instead. And then with science, we mentioned this, we can see that with fifth grade, it's just one grade level that's, that's taken that science SOL. And it's, it's an area that we'll, we'll dig a little bit deeper into that now that we can see this. And then for the middle school, they have the reading, the math, history, science, and a writing SOL in eighth grade. 
you'll see with the reading and the math that all three grade levels are included with that one. The, um, the reading's pretty consistent, I mean, with, within a few points. Our um, L's or LIEPs, one thing we have to keep in mind here is that the population at Mary Ellen Henderson for our L's is very small. I think currently, for example, we have only 17 students. Out of those 17, if some of them are new to us, and they didn't come right at the beginning of the school year, they're actually exempt from the reading, so it actually takes it down even further. So the, the numbers, um, 90 could have been five kids, you know, and out of those five kids, you know, four of them, they, they passed, you know, and the other one might not have. So it just, it just depends, I'm just hypothetically. So the numbers, you gotta dig a little deeper and look and really look at those kids. And then for our high school, we have the end of course reading, math, algebra one, geometry, and algebra two are the ones that count for the standards of learning. And for our history, we have our Virginia and US history, world history, one, two, geography. Um, and then science, biology, chemistry, or science. And then they have an end of course writing as well. That's in here. And when we're looking down the row, you can see we still have some of those, those red areas that are a little bit you know, questionable that we just want to take a look at. But pretty consistent. There's been a few drops. In 94 and 93, it's not anything to be you know, totally alarmed about in some of the areas. And when we're looking a little bit deeper and not just looking at standards of learning, we're looking at our students at the high school who are taking advanced courses. And we have AP, IB, and dual enrollment, DE courses at the high school. Uh, the, there are seven AP courses being offered currently, um, 36 IB courses and four dual enrollment courses. In ninth grade, we have 6% of our students are taking AP courses, and typically AP courses are, aren't taken until about 10th grade. In 10th grade, 57% are taking AP. IB isn't available until 11th grade, as well as dual enrollment for the older kids. In 11th grade, 23% are in AP, 25% IB, and 34% are in dual enrollment. And some of those cross over. So the same kids that might be taking IB courses might also be taking AP or vice versa or dual enrollment. So, and then with 12th grade, same thing. So the numbers do increase here with 45% for AP, 81% are now in taking at least one IB course and 26% in dual enrollment. So we have a lot of opportunities for those advanced courses for our kids. And then looking at a little bit more data, we have um, the WIDA access for L's. And the WIDA access for L's is, is just for our English learners. And we had 39 out of 142 receiving services students actually reach proficiency and exited the program. The score changed for the first time last year because the test was more rigorous. And what we were finding is that our kids were not doing as well on the test across the state and across the other states that actually use the WIDA access because of the rigor. So the Department of um, Virginia Department of Education made the decision that they were going to lower the score for kids to exit the program. So it used to be five, they had to have a level five proficiency. And last year it was a 4.4. So if they met the 4.4 criteria, we had to exit them from the program. And um, we're going to do it again this year. So they want to have another year to look at the data to make a decision whether or not they're going to up it again to five or leave it, leave it at that score. And just want to clarify that with the um, for our L's, even though they may exit, if they still need instruction um, interventions, we have them go through our multi-tier system of support and make sure that we're still meeting the needs of our students. Just because they're in an exit, it um, doesn't mean that they they will not continue to receive support from either our classroom teacher or our specialist um, as needed through our intervention systems. Yeah, we definitely keep an eye on them. And then for the star reading and star math, you've seen maybe this chart before, but basically what we're trying to do here, Summer Manis um, put this together for us, is we're following a cohort of students. So now we're looking a little bit more at apples to apples. So if you're looking, for example, I'm gonna start with the, um, the blue circle at 4.7. 
um, for 2014-15 in second grade. So those second graders, when they were third graders, this is the um, grade equivalency. So in second grade, they were scoring at a, a 4.7 grade range. In third grade, they were scoring at 6.2. And in fourth grade, this previous year, they were scoring at a 6.8. So you're actually looking at the same cohort of students as they go down diagonally. And that's showing us that they are continuing to make growth in, in reading um, as they take the, the STAR assessment. And then same thing for math. So you can see the, the same cohort of kids now and moving down the line um, diagonally is how they're performing. And you'll see that they do max out eventually. Uh, so looking down seventh grade and eighth grade at the 12.9, um, they're pretty much mastering the, that content. All right, so now we're go going to talk about what we do next. Um, tonight you've heard a lot about our um, special populations and how they've achieved on the SOLs is something that we we'll share with you. But we do use multiple measures like STAR and benchmark tests to look at growth over the year using formative assessments. Um, and so as um, Dr. Noonan has shared and is a part of the, the triennial plan and, and the goals for this year is we're really focusing on uh, multi-tiered systems of support, RTI, which is response to intervention, which is our academic component, as well as we're looking at um, PBIS, which is our social, emotional, and behavior component. And this year, we're really focusing as a division on our tier one core instruction, what happens in the classroom that every student receives. We're looking at ways to tighten what happens there, um, and looking at creating flow charts to help people understand what the process is um, to get to make sure that we're we're taking students and meeting their needs as early as possible um, we're clarif clarifying the characteristics around our tier one um, instruction as well um, each school has a problem solving um, team to address both academic and behavioral social emotional needs of our students and you know with our economically disadvantaged our L's and our special education students we are looking at that and making sure that we're we're getting um, students in that problem solving team as early as possible to provide interventions with teachers or going in you know some of our specialists go into the classrooms to to work with our teachers to build capacity in our classroom teachers that's something we want to to make sure we do is build a capacity in our, our classroom teachers. Um, for our special populations, um, we're going to make sure that our, our effective evidence of effectiveness is for there to be a 10% increase um, for students with disabilities, English learners, um, as well as our economically disadvantaged. Every um, school will be working this year to create an action plan based on data um, to improve the academic out outcomes for our subgroup populations. Again, we're working with teachers and um, providing um, information on our tier one core instruction. Um, some of the early release Wednesdays we're working with our, our teachers um, to present and, and not, we're not necessarily bringing people in. We're also using our own staff who um, are great at what they do. So we're asking, we're tapping our own staff to share some of the skills and um, strategies that they use with students to help them be successful. Um, we're also working to make sure that we incorporate um, the IB philosophy um, and make sure that across all of our special populations they're able to access um, all of the program and we're promoting more creativity curiosity and problem-solving for those for everyone and then the last priority is that it oh that's it oh I you had already went. done yeah. it um, we're looking at um, our approaches to learning um, making sure that we are um, helping students you know with research um, thinking self-management um, communication and having them work collaboratively um, we'll be working with our teachers this year to create rubrics um, to see if students are being successful, if they are um, mastering and, and the rubrics and making sure that they know the learner profile and they're using it in their everyday um, work that they do um, so that when they, we, when they leave us, they, they are doing what they need and they're lifelong learners and um, I'm losing my... Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Just a... Hmm? Oh, go ahead. What would you say? What's your favorite ice cream? Chocolate. Chocolate. 
fuck up. <laughs> um, so we're, we're just really working with all of our students to make sure that, you know, they can access the International Baccalaureate. And we're working with our teachers um, this Thursday. We're meeting with our middle and, and high school staff to look at our program and reflect on what we've done last year and look at how we can move forward to make sure that we continue to grow and, and be better at this program. Because we pride ourselves on being an uh, International Baccalaureate school, um, and we think it's really what's, what's great for kids. So next one is any questions from you? Thank you both very much. Uh, questions? Um, I do. First of all, I want to um, congratulate you both and your staff for the in huge increase we've seen with the ESOL scores. That was, you know, a concerted effort and it was in, in the making. I thank you both for this. Um, I do have a question about the categories of e um, e ELs. Um, economically disadvantaged and those with disabilities. Um, I'm looking at that pie chart. Do any of those categories overlap yes. or do you just select a, a student and stick them in one? No, they, they it overlap. It can be in more than one. Yes. Okay. You but know, just as one of the um, slides show that something we do have dual identified and so they would show up in both or could be all three categories. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Castillo? First, uh, a question, are, are gifted and talented, is that considered a special population? Um, we, don't, we don't consider them a special population. Um, we, we look at just across the board how our gifted students are doing even with the STAR. We're looking for growth even for our, our students as they access the, the STAR um, test because we want to make sure there's growth across the board. Um, so a lot of times you will see gifted as listed as a special population, um, but we really, when a, a lot of our students are, are pretty high <coughs> achievers, um, so we, we, look at, we look at them as, as far as being identified as a special population, but our program is geared for, for all of our students. I hope that answers your question. Well, well I think there, there's, a, there's a problem on the gifted side, as I understand it, with respect to SOLs and other things where you, you have difficulty measuring growth because they're basically firewalled. And, and it seems to me that it would be worthwhile to find ways to measure growth nonetheless because mm -hmm. that's a, I, I think every, every child in our system should have their growth attended to and, and they should be able to grow and we need to be able to show how each child is doing. And so, you know, I, I would suggest that we need to address that problem where some of our metrics don't seem to be up to the task. I mean, we, we do look as far as STAR is just one measure. We're also looking at our AP scores, our IB scores, because that's where some of our students are accessing some of their um, higher achieving scores. So we do have IB and AP scores that we could bring back and, and share with you. Okay, and then another thing is, is I, I would say the, the longitudinal analysis in the STAR slide that you showed was great. I. I I'm very concerned, and I've beat this drum for several years, that just showing how fifth grade did this year versus last year doesn't show you a darn thing and probably actively misleads people into drawing the wrong conclusions and into not addressing things that need to be addressed. And so I, I, I would <coughs> beg you that when you present numbers that they, they mean something, because otherwise just comparing an apple to an orange doesn't do anybody any good. And, and you, when you see what the star scores show, it's so much more helpful than just throwing up numbers. And, and I, I, th I really think we need to hold ourselves to a higher standard on that, again, with respect to showing how each child in our system is progressing. And, you know, if there's a different cohort this year versus last year, we need to call that out and, and not create undue sense of worries that if the numbers are changing significantly that people think the bottom's fallen out when in fact you're just dealing with a different population. Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to be much more disciplined with how we present data so that it's not causing us more problems than good. Dr. Manning. I, I just want to um, <coughs> first of all say thank you for that question or that comment. I think it is something that we need to pay attention to. Structurally, um, one of the issues with the standards of learning assessments is that they're not scaled from one grade level to the next. So if we were to show a cohort of students coming through and showing, say, their, their fifth grade and their eighth grade and their ninth grade and their eleventh grade, 
it, it is still showing apples to oranges because they're not scaled to be able to show that growth that way. I think that's one of the reasons that we're excited um, to be able to put together, um, if you think profile of a graduate and then have that profile of a 12th grader with the approaches to learning and how we're working with the IB program to incorporate those approaches to learning and the profile of um, an IB student and then work that back to eighth grade and work it back to fifth grade and work it back to third grade and work it back to first grade to be able to follow those students in that cohort looking that way um, it really I think will enable us to begin to collect some of these data now these data that we hope to collect are not going to be like other data you might find in other school systems but I think they'll be meaningful to us and I think that that's going to be equally equally important um, moving forward Thank you for that. Other questions? Mr. Mr. Uh, Reninger. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> a couple quick thoughts. One, um, I, um, like Mr. Castillo, would like very much to see cohort analysis. I wonder if it would be possible to normalize scores. Um, now, understanding you don't get the same tests every year, so it's not as good to do. But if you, you know, if you just, for example, took the, for each year, took what the score was and, you know, whether we were above or below the state average, then as the state average would reflect the change and you could observe whether a cohort was, you know, holding consistent with the state or dropping off. And maybe it's subtraction, maybe it's division. But there ought to be a way to statistically normalize that so you could still get it wouldn't be as, as valuable because it's not as full a table as STAR, but you could still do some cohort level analysis that would, you know, get around better the problem of, well, you know, we've got a new group of students and, you know, this one has different issues than the prior group. Um, the second thing I, is also something that uh, Mr. Castillo spoke about. Um, I, I'm just generally less interested in SOL scores for the majority of our kids. Um, the, well, I think it's important to look at, you know, especially for groups that have may, may start from a, a lower achievement base, it's really valuable. What the last thing I want to have teachers doing is put, you know, all the weight on SOL so they teach to the test um, rather than, you know, teaching the stuff that kids really need to learn. So I, I, I mean, whatever we can do to sort of say, here's what we're going to look at, here's the judgments we can make, you know, looking at things like, I, I mean, I, I think the, the number of kids we graduate, you know, as long as we're not graduating kids that shouldn't be graduated is, is a great metric. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, there are whatever we can do in that space. The one thing that I think did sort of cut across the, the spectrum on the, you know, a place that we, I think we needed to devote more effort was economically disadvantaged students. I mean, there was a lot of red there. Um, as um, Ms. Ward said, there was some really great progress on um, English language learners, um, and you could see special, other special populations, but generally, you know, there was, there was more, we were not as, as well performing on economically disadvantaged students. And I also know uh, that we've got, I think, the lowest percentage, right, of economically disadvantaged students in the state. Um, so I, you know, I don't know if those are correlated to some degree or not, but I think it's worth, as you, I think you are probably doing, as you discussed, um, trying to do some root cause analysis um, of what, what leads to that. Um, because it, it ought to be, you know, I mean, well, it, it may just be, you know, if, if a kid, if, if there are, or if, if economically disadvantaged kids are more isolated, they don't perform as well. But one could come up with multiple, you know, causes for that, and I think it's worth thinking through what those would be. Uh, but thank you very much. It's, it's a great presentation. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. We made it shorter than last year. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I do. I have one. It's not really directly related to your um, presentation, but I noticed the de developmental delay um, um, percentage of students rose significantly, like 92 percent. Do you know what is accounting for that? I don't. I can it has nothing to do with to like you. additional students at the preschool level or anything like that. I mean, no, because the students who are in the preschool would be coming 
to Falls yeah. Church anyway, but I'll, I'll ask Liz if she has some, uh, not if you some information to share. And you can. And I can email you. All right, thanks. Anything else? Uh, just for my comments, and it was been mentioned now by a couple of folks about the economically disadvantaged students where the red really kind of stood out a little bit. Um, what type of things do you potentially do to to work with that that group of, of students? Is there anything you don't have to talk to? Tell me tonight, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, it just that just stand, kind of jumps out at me a little bit of just wanting to make sure because I know we have a overall high performing school district and that population is not big, but it's a population that I want to see be able to achieve at the same levels as all the other students. And I'm, I'm guessing I'm assuming potentially some of the issues they have comes with that economic piece of things that the school can provide itself, but then they may not have that same potential level of support on the home front from potentially maybe having to work, do things like that are some of the things that you potentially identify as maybe why that that particular group has a little bit more struggle than others um with with our economically disadvantaged students we are really working to tighten our rti process to make sure that we are identifying those students based on teacher recommendation um, benchmarks that tests that we give um, formative assessments throughout the year um, and we're working with our teachers to not spend a long time working with students who they see may, see may be struggling go ahead and bring them to the problem solving team sooner and we're hoping that that will um, help us you know catch some of those students you know their their deficit skills that they may have a little bit earlier um, you know, with, with economically disadvantaged, um, we have to be very confidential mm -hmm. with who those students mm -hmm. are. Um, so that's not, you know, that can't be broadly advertised who the students are. So we're looking at that as well as um, with our, you know, some of our PAL scores, trying to look at early interventions, what's happening in the early elementary school years and where we can see those skills and then try to um, hone into those um, and do some after school work with students, um, some of our programs that are after school. You know, a lot of times we say it's for L population, but we invite any student who um, may have some academic deficits to to give them some more um, support in our in the afternoon after school as well as through our summer academy. And we're trying not to make our summer academy not be skill and drill, but things that are very interested in help interesting in helping students to, to broaden um, just their knowledge base. So hopefully that. I I only <coughs> I only sort of. Um, I go, but snickered a little because it is one of those things that it's really hard to get our hands around uh, because we don't publicly know who those students that are economically disadvantaged are because of the um, FERPA, FERPA rules. Um, however, it's a good indicator for us to remember that we need to provide best first practice with all of our kids mm -hmm. and be able to differentiate to meet the needs of all of our kids, whether it's ratcheting up and providing extension and enrichment for students that need that extra push or ratcheting up for those students that really need some gaps filled. Um, so we, uh, and as Ms. High mentioned, you know, that multi-tiered system of support is really meant to do that, is really meant to figure out very specifically in an individual by name and by need way, okay, what does Peter need today? He needs some extra support in mathematics, but Lisa, she's ready to rock and roll, and so we're gonna take some, some uh, correlated above grade level standards and provide her with that extra push that she deserves too during that, that tiger pause or during that Mustang block or during the Husky time or whatever um, the time is during that school day. Yeah, it's just uh, kind of picking up where uh, Mr. Ranger and Mr. Casillo said, mm -hmm. you know, SLLs are overall totally. something you have to do, but it for most of our students, it's other ways for us to assess where they are, but for those special populations, I think they are helpful in letting us know where they are and kind of sometimes where our gaps are of, that we need to potentially focus on and do a little bit more. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, we're going to move on to uh, 7.02, the adoption of superintendent's goals. I'll turn over to Dr. Nimmy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, normally, I would say I'd, I'm just asking for you to approve as uh, written and distributed, printed and distributed, as mentioned at the school board work session last time. But um, given the context of tonight's data conversation, I, I do want to just take a second uh, to reiterate what my 
division-wide focuses of learning um, are going to be for the school division for this year, next year, and the following year, because I do think that this is a three-year process. Um, and the first is really to look at, by June of 2020, a consolidation of learning uh, for each grade level of students at grades 1, 5, 8, 10, and 12 to utilize and develop those approaches to learning um, and to be able to showcase their knowledge as measured by a student project. Um, it gets to, I think, what the comment was from Mr. Castillo and, and Mr. Reitinger as well, and that is how do we go deeper into content and how do we look at how the IV program is influencing the work that our kids are doing and how does that create then, then depth and complexity with respect to that um, content and that learning as well. And I think that this uh, is an exciting possibility for us because not to our knowledge, there's no one else that we're aware of that has any kind of um, you know, profile of a first grader, profile of a third grader, profile of fifth grader, eighth grader, and twelfth grader um, within the, the world of IB. So um, we think that we can, we can kind of help lead around that. Uh, the second goal is uh, ensuring that student-centered teacher uh, and teaching and learning through the multi-tiered systems of support. You've heard that a couple of times tonight, um, but by making sure that by 2020 all of our schools have a clearly defined uh, an implemented multi-tier system of support that includes high quality best practices for instruction for all students uh, and a structured and timely intervention process for all of the kids that we serve. Um, I, just a very quickly, my, uh, this is a silly story in the context of this, but I feel like we could break the evening up just for five seconds. But my son and I went to, uh, uh, went to Harper's Ferry a couple weeks ago. We were coming back and he said, I'd like to stop for lunch. And I said, okay, where do you want to stop for lunch? And we were driving along and there was an A&W root beer place. And he said, I've never had an A&W root beer. Can we stop and get an A&W root beer? I said, sure. So we stopped and we pulled off and we got an A&W. Stopped, walked into the A&W and we said, we like an A&W root beer. And they said, I'm sorry, we're out of root beer. <laughs> and I thought, what? You're the A&W root beer. How can you be out of root beer? My son was stunned, sort of stepped back and said, what am I supposed to do about this? I said, what do you want to do? And he said, can we just go? I was like, yeah. So we left. But the point of that is, it's like, what is your systematic process that you have in place to ensure that you have what you need to get the best out there for your community, your customers, your partners? Because it seems to me when you're running halfway low on root beer, like some lights should be going off. Like, hey, we're getting low. When you get down to a quarter, some, al uh, some alarms going off saying, we're almost out of root beer. Well, we have these kids that are really struggling and it seems like at a certain point, we should have some lights that go off that say, hey, what's your systematic process? What's your plan to ensure these kids are gonna get that extra support? And when our kids continue to fail, what are the, what are the sounds and the bells and the whistles that are going off? How are we making sure that we capture those? And this multi-tiered system of support really is meant to, to close that gap. And I'm, I'm looking forward to working with our schools on that as well. Um, and then the, the last uh, instructional goal is ensuring that we have equitable access to all of our uh, programs and to meeting the needs of our special population. So you saw, as indicated in the presentation tonight and even commented, there was a lot of red, for example, in our um, economically disadvantaged populations, in our ELL populations. We make great gains in our EL population this last year. But is it is it good enough? And I, I would question, we've got room, to, or wouldn't question, I would say we've got room to grow. And we definitely have room to grow with our special education population as well. So how do we, how do we close those gaps to bring it um, closer to what um, our general ed population looks like? And so look forward to working through that. And then the last one was um, an operational goal, as you'll recall, um, making sure that we have an efficient and effective organization. Um, and so one of the things that you, uh, that we talked about was that we would uh, create operational processes and systems that would be aligned to support the triennial plan with 100% fidelity, and we would show growth over a baseline in systems of e uh, efficiency and effectiveness. That's a huge lift for us in the system because there aren't any real metrics around how we look at operations currently, so I do want to pull out a couple of operational components of the organization and start with those and kind of move through um, going forward. So with that, presentation by Lisa and by Jeannie as the backdrop. Um, I respectfully request that you support me and um, these being the superintendent's goals that we can work together on uh, as a board, as a superintendent, as uh, a staff, as we continue to grow and learn together going forward for the next three years. Thank you, Dr. Nana. Are there any questions? All right. I'll entertain a motion, please. Mr. Um, Chair. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I move that the school board adopt the superintendent's goals as presented. 
Second. Se I get to second. You get to second. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. 7.03, the adoption of the revised support sta support salary scale. I'm gonna I'm gonna very quickly turn this over to Deidre McLaughlin, um, but this is a technical um, issue that she's here to talk about tonight. Um, and without giving the whole story away, I'll turn. I was it over gonna to say, you. if you say much about this, I, you will have said everything. <laughs> there's not a lot to say. Um, our all of the salary scales are that we maintain. They're part of the budget you adopt. They're, they're kept in Excel, and the formulas are in there, so you whatever changes you all make uh, will get, get made. And that happened this year. But in the course of our work, putting, I think it was when we were putting a new person on the salary scale, we saw that th some of the lanes on the um, technology series weren't displayed in the documents that we provided the school board. They were there, but they weren't displayed. They were hidden in the in the Excel spreadsheet. Prior years, they had been there. I don't know what happened. I can speculate, but I really don't know. This is just a technical correction to 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 amend the budget, if you will, for the for one page of the salary scales. Any questions? All right. I will entertain a motion, please. Mr. Chairman, I move that the school board adopt a revised support staff schedule for the 2017-2018 school year. Second. Thank you, Mr. Ankuma. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. And now we'll move on to approval and adoptions of second reading of policies. Ms. Minson. Good evening. We have five policies for second reading tonight. Um, all of which we reviewed on September 12th. The first is policy JHCE, recommendation of medication by school personnel. This is a new policy um, to come into line with the Virginia Code. Um, training has already been provided to staff. There were no proposed changes at our first reading. Any questions on this policy? Questions? Nope. No. Pretty short. Second policy is policy BCB, school board officers. This would um, replace current FCCPS policy 2.12. Um, there were no changes between um, to this proposed at the last meeting on first reading. Any questions? BCE. Uh, that's BCB. Oh, sorry, sorry, my enunciation was not the best. BCE is next if there's nothing on BCB. Okay, BCE is school board committees. This was former FCCPS bylaw 213. Um, there had been some questions last time that I was not on the ball on answering as far as what, <coughs> how this related to our other policies. And in looking at that, um, I realized, and, and, and in talking with Mr. Lawrence, and I know he's not here tonight, but I appreciated his perspective on this. Um, we added some language based on um, on this policy in the past. I also added a reference down at the bottom to former policy 5.12. So this is different than the citizens um, advisory committees that the school board does appoint. This is whether the school board has any standing committees. Um, so there were a few changes um, to this based on the last policy. Are there any questions as it's written now for BCE school board committees? All right. Um, next is BCA, school board organizational meeting. This would replace FCCPS bylaw 2.22. Um, we did add to this from last time that um, sentence it's in red, the second sentence that appears at lines four through seven, that at the organizational meeting, the superintendent presides up until the first order of business, which is the election of the school board chair. That's the point at which the chair assumes office and presides over the election of the vice chair. That made sense that we had that in our previous policies. We, uh, there was a suggestion that seemed to be supported by the board to add that. We also added that um, the, the election of a vice chairman would be mandatory pre um, language of sh shall instead of may. Any questions about those or any other um, questions about BCA? And, and why did we say we had to do the, the vice chair? Uh, my notes indicate that the question came up, if we're definitely going to have a vice chair, why do we say may instead of shall, since it's something we anticipate we will always want to do? Um, so I thought that made sense, since the shall language requires the board to do that. If the board wants to put it back to may, 
that's what was proposed in the model policy rules, I think either way is, is acceptable. And under the code, it's discretionary. Under the code, it's discretionary. That's true. Under which code? The Virginia state um, code, state code 22.1, 72, and 76. Well, then can we, as a Fulcher school, City School Board, make it mandatory? Yes, and that's what we would be doing if we used the word shall, whereas if we kept it as may, we'd be required to have a chair, but there'd be no requirement that there'd be a vice chair. Any further discussion? Any preference of one way or the other? I, I don't really care, but it's just that it's clear that the code doesn't require that. Uh, given the way the meeting started today, I vote for Shaw. <laughs> <laughs> not to mention I the chairman's I, I, travel I, I, schedule. I, I probably yeah, would agree. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll, we'll go on from that. Go okay. Right uh, the last policy for second reading tonight is BCC school board clerk. That would replace our policy by, at bylaw 2.16. We had at the last meeting discussed whether or not to outline what the duties of the clerk was, and it was a consensus of the board since that's clearly outlined in the Virginia Code what is expected of a clerk. There's no need to reiterate that as part of the code. So um, other than removing 40-some-odd lines of a description of what the clerk did, which was a word-for-word -word, um, take from the Virginia Code, um, there would be no changes from the last um, presentation of these. Any questions, Any changes? questions? Mr. Castillo? I'm, I'm asking for Ms. Ward, who, who just wondered what, how much are, uh, is the clerk and deputy, how much are they bonded for? And is $10,000 a realistic, I mean, would you ever want to do it that small? That's what you're required by the Virginia Code to be bonded amount. I'm not sure what they're actually bonded at. I can the, look into that. I believe that the, the it's, it's a, wrapped into your general liability insurance. So I think that I don't know that there's bonds involved, but there is insurance against loss. A fidelity bond on the clerk? I don't think it's a, I don't know their bond. That I don't know. I know we pay for insurance. Specifically for the clerk? For the school board, yes. We could talk about soft line. I think we should. Okay. Glad you actually had something to say about. It. I was just spotting the issue. <laughs> I don't uh, necessarily think it's a reason not to adopt the policy at this point, but it is something that we should get the answer to and make sure that we have the appropriate bonding. Um, if everyone agrees, yeah, that's it for that. second for second reading. Okay. Any questions about any of those uh, policies? If not, um, I entertain our motion for approval. <laughs> Just kidding. I move that the school board approve and adopt the second reading of the following policies. Policy JHCE, recommendation of medication by school personnel. Policy BCB, school board officers. Policy BCE, school board committees. Policy BCA, school board organizational meeting. And policy BCC, school board clerk. Thank you, Ms. Gill. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Nkuma. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. All right. Continue on with uh, Ms. Minton with approval of first reading of policies. Yes, sir. We have three policies for first reading today. Um, technically, one of them is would be combining two um, policies into one. The first is the economic interest, um, the disclosure statement required of the superintendent under the new policy organization. It would be CBCA. It would be replacing policy 3.8, the economic interest disclosure statement. Um, it is. Um, has slightly different wording than our previous policy. It removes the requirement that the Director of Finance um, file a personal um, disclosure statement since that's not required under the code, um, but in other ways is, is quite similar to the previous policy. Are there any questions about CBCA? Questions? All right, continue. Second policy is policy model policy GCPF, suspension of staff members. This would replace um, policy 8.3, which is just titled suspension. It in many ways is similar to um, the language of our previous policy, um, almost word for word, since much of this is taken from the Virginia Code. Um, there was one section that was in policy 8.34 that talks about um, 
staff members cannot be suspended for refusal to perform health-related services. That's in a separate section of the model policies that we're going to be moving towards GC. PD, which I expect to present for first reading at the next school board session, so it would be removed temporarily but added back in and under the code. Certainly no school board member could, or school board employee other than um, administrative personnel could be suspended um, for failure to perform health related services. We, I did propose adding the last sentence of policy 3.4 back in, so it's in red in the policy as it appears on board docs, um, saying that nothing in the policy shall be construed to limit the authority of the school board to dismiss or place on probation employee um, pursuant to 22.1307. I would <coughs> note, John Lawrence raised a question with me earlier, why um, that language referenced Chapter 15, Article 3 of the code, and I think we can take out that. That's just saying where the code section appears. Um, so that would be one amendment that I would make coming forward for second reading, if you all approve this for first reading, is to take out Chapter 15, Article 3, <coughs> there in line 13 on page 2. Um, but otherwise, this is quite similar to our previous policy, 8.34. Any questions on the proposed policy on suspension of staff members? It's like now. Uh, just uh, so is this is this an exhaustive list or would there be other I mean there's the the catch-all at the end that you that's added but but is is the list that's there the entire range of, of issues meriting suspension or allowing suspension For suspension, I believe so. Um, and that's expressly what's provided in the Virginia Code. Um, this is for, this is separate and apart from an employee being placed on administrative leave with or without pay. So this is when somebody's suspended from their duty. It, I know common practice in local school boards is uh, administrative leave with pay pending an outcome. So it's separate. Um, suspension is a separate action than that. Um, but to suspend um, a teacher for good and just cause, it does need to uh, meet these requirements or fall under one of these code provisions. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Any other questions? Is line six wide enough? What's that? Line six? Safety or welfare of the school division or students therein is threatened sort of to Mr. Castillo's Sure, that, that would allow, you would have to be able to have evidence to prove that it rises to that level, but safety and welfare um, could be a, a reason for suspension and that would be subject to yeah mm -hmm. the discretion of likely the superintendent and supervisors all right i'll move on to the last one of the night which is policy g c p b which is resignation of staff members in our previous policies it had been uh, the resignation of teachers was at 8.62 and the resignation of support staff was at 8.72 um, so this proposed policy merges the two together and I think that's why you'll see when you look at the policy on board docs there's so much in red which was taking language from our previous version that seemed to make sense and work in line with what we do. Uh, the first of those appears at line six saying that the written notice of non-continuation of the contract by either party must be given by June 15th of each year otherwise the contract continues in effect the ensuing year. That's required under the Virginia Code. It wasn't explicit in the model policy and since it's required and applies anyway we thought might as well make it clear for all parties to know that June 15th is a date by which um, both the school division and a, a teacher with a continuing contract has to give notice of their intent um, to, to no longer continue with that contract. Um, I did change also at line 20, we put two calendar weeks in the VSBA model policies. The amount of time in which a staff member had to give notice of resignation was given as um, 10 school days. And I have had in other divisions um, questions come up of what is a school day if school's out of session or there's no summer school or at summertime can someone who's um, the continuing contractor in a position not um, give their notice two calendar weeks is clear and there's no doubt of what's a school day what's not a school day so that's what I would recommend um, there and then the 14 days notice it also there later at lines 23 to 28 um, under the Virginia uh, school board model policies an employee who wants to terminate their employment has if they don't give that notice um, is, in, is not able to leave and can continue to be bound. This allows under extenuating or emergency circumstances, a superintendent may approve um, a request for termination with less than those two calendar weeks notice and then the superintendent does have the authority um, to, to, in response to a reference check, um, advise the employee resigned his or her position without sufficient notice. The superintendent would not have to do that, but that would be an option if we were to um, get a request to terminate 
with less than the notice required under the Virginia Code. So I thought that was a fair balance of um, giving the discretion to the superintendent, but recognizing that there then might be limitations upon any, any reference that, that comes in the future. Any questions about this proposed policy? Mr. Castillo? So, so if a teacher wants to resign before June 15th? They're required to give written notice to the division. But and then under the mechanics of it, the resigning after June fifteenth, they don't have to resign by July first, do they? Or in other words, the, the the school year, the July first doesn't isn't a factor in how much notice and and when their contract expires, or or is it? July first is not a factor. Under June fifteenth is is the date by which. They have to give notice or contracts so are automatically. So continued. they could do it in on July 10th or any time during the summer, or for the school the next the upcoming next school, school year. year, but not for the if somebody had wanted to retire at the end of the 2016-17 school year and didn't give notice until July 1st, then technically they weren't complying with um, the requirements under the code unless they were resigning at the end of the 2017-18 school year. So if a teacher who's on a continuing contract doesn't give notice by the June 15th of that school year that they don't plan on coming back, um, then they are subject to a continuing contract. I know we've had it come up in the past where um, divisions have told us that they won't let someone out of a contract because they didn't give them notice by June 15th. Got it. Okay. Thanks. So you can hold them to it to yes. stay another year. Yes. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If not, I would entertain a motion, please. Mr. Chair, I move that the school board approve first reading of the following policies. Policy CBCA, disclosure statement required of superintendent, policy GCPF, suspension of staff members, and policy GCPB, resignation of staff members. Thank you very much. A second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Gill. All in favor, please aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, and then we're going to move on to the proclamation on bullying, which I will read. And so if anyone has any questions, uh, Falls Church City Public Schools Proclamation 03-17 Bullying Prevention Month. Whereas school school bullying has been an increasing and increasingly significant problem in the United States and Virginia, and whereas over 20% of the youth in the United States are estimated to be involved in bullying each year, either as a, as a bully or, a, or a, as a victim, and whereas an estimated 160,000 students in kindergarten through 12th grade miss school every day due to fear of being bullied, and whereas bullying can take many forms, including verbal, physical, and most recently in cyberspace and can happen in many places on and off school grounds. And whereas it is important for Virginia parents, students, teachers, school administrators, and school boards to be aware of bullying and to encourage discussions of the problem as a school community. And whereas the Falls Church City Public School Board encourages positive behavior and to eliminate bullying behavior. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church City Public School Board recognizes the month of October 2017 as Bullying Prevention Month with the intentions that the issue of bullying and its prevention be discussed in classrooms and at the Foster City Public Schools. So we'll entertain a motion to do, do, ask you now to expel. Oh, wait a minute. Yes. Before you do that. Yes. Uh, just, uh, first, I just thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank you all for taking this up. Um, obviously, bullying prevention is something that's very uh, important to all of us uh, as a school division uh, to the extent that we can do our part to stop bullying from happening uh, this, this year before the school year began. Um, Tricia Minson did uh, a program with all of the teachers in the City of Falls Church talking about what bullying is. Uh, and how to appropriately um, address it and deal with it. And one of the things that I want to make sure that he, you all, as well as the community know, is that when there is an incident of bullying that does go to the principal, 
Um, there are multiple ways that are dealt that it is dealt with depending on the level of severity of the bullying sometimes through um, conversation and leading all the way up to um, even greater consequence um, all of our teachers that witness it are asked to report it to um, our school administrators so that we can track those incidents of bullying that are occurring so that everyone knows when it's happening um, unfortunately it is one of the more insidious kinds of behaviors uh, that we see with kids but if we all have our, our eyes and our ears to the ground and we're talking with a single point of contact that principal or that administrator then we can start to add some pieces up to determine when it's really becoming a problem with some kids um, so I, and and by the way bullying doesn't stop with kids either it happens with our staff it happens with um, our own community and so we are as committed to ensuring that our our teachers and our staff work in a place that is free of bullying free of harassment um, as well as our students. So I just want to say thanks for taking this up and recognizing um, that it's an important component to making sure that our kids are safe and it really digs at um, one of those core values that I hold and that's in fairness and equity for all kids because the last thing I want to do is have students that are afraid to come to school and I'm afraid to, and, I, and the last thing is I'm, I would not want uh, teachers to, to be, be, be fearful to come to school as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nene. Uh, if someone would make the motion to adopt the resolution uh, mr. chair I move that the school board adopt proclamation 03-17 bullying prevention month as prevent as presented thank you very much for the second second thank you mr. Ankuma all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed thank you very much and there's a proclamation to make sure that you sign it before you leave this evening are there any future agenda items that anyone would like to to bring up and discuss? If not, thank you. And we'll move to the <coughs> superintendent's report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a few things this evening. Um, the first is that George Mason High School Senior Day is Wednesday. Um, while the rest of the school is taking the PSAT, the seniors will spend time in very special sessions that will be designed for them, including voter registration so that they can, they can vote. Um, and planning for externships and many other really great things. So I, I know that Wednesday is going to be a great day for our seniors. Um, TJ held an afternoon professional development um, recently with the true experts in building teachers and leading sessions for their colleagues. Um, it was unique because it was truly led by our staff. So when uh, Ms. High was talking about building the capacity of our, st our staff to be leaders in the building, um, I, I just want to give a shout out to um, to the leadership over at TJ for their ability to identify those teachers that have that extra special skill and be able to talk with others about it. So topics range from classroom management to differentiation of instruction and diversity in, in our curriculum. So uh, excited about that. Uh, George Mason High School students are holding a series currently of hurricane relief efforts. A community yard sale is happening on October 21st. Um, so if you are interested in cleaning out your closets and getting rid of some things and donating to a cause, please don't hesitate to do that. At Mary Ellen Henderson, students are staying at, uh, starting to get out in the community for their service learning projects. And some of you may have seen them. Uh, of course, they have a certain number of hours that they have to achieve. Um, they'll be traveling to uh, field sites during the school day and working with um, young students, elderly, and on some environmental projects. Um, as volunteers. So look for our kids out in the community. That will be really a lot of fun. On Wednesday, October 25th from 4 to 7, um, all community members are invited to um, tour as, as a community guest of ours, uh, the George Mason High School. Um, and this is part of the um, process of helping people understand um, what the needs of the school are uh, with respect to its physical plant. So from Octo on, on October 25th from 4 to 7, there will be teacher and student led uh, tours uh, for community members. So um, please join us there. And that is it, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Any questions for the superintendent? Mr. Castillo? Yes, thank you, Dr. Noonan. Uh, recently, there was a, an item that uh, came out in the public uh, media uh, written by. Um, my good friend Mark Quave, our, our sons graduated together a couple of years ago, uh, saying that uh, a proposal that uh, the interim superintendent devised for George Mason uh, about a $50 million 
George Mason expansion should be something that should be seriously considered because it would meet the needs of the students, save substantial money, and, and not compromise development uh, potential for a portion of the, the site there. And uh, I, I wondered if you had any thoughts about that proposal from Dr. Schiller, that $50 million option, whether it's really viable or if not, why? Um, thanks for raising that as a question. Um, we've gotten a lot of comments and a lot of questions about what um, we are affectionately calling the Schiller model um, that did come out. And I, um, I've put together some thoughts um, about that that I've been sharing with the community when I have the opportunity. So if you'll indulge me, I, I might refer to my notes here because I've spent some time thinking about it. But um, I went back and I did, because uh, a lot of this happened prior to my arrival. And I think it's important for me to know the history. So um, what I do know is this, is that, uh, or as I understand it, in January of 17 this year, um, the school board and the city council reviewed 13 different options. Um, and, and I understand that that was a joint meeting. Um, and when you got those 13 options, there were a lot of questions that came up um, as a consequence of that. And some of the questions that came up were, what does a gut renovation cost? What is considered a modest renovation? Um, would it be cost effective to do the, the renovation? Would it be cost effective to do it in one stage? Would it be cost effective to do it in two stages or phases? Um, or does it make sense to do one phased um, brand new building? So the options were priced out um, by Bob Jones from Arcadis that I think everybody knows here based on a square foot basis. And at the uh, January 31st, joint session with the two elected bodies, it was narrowed down to five options that were most practical based on cost, the number of years required to do the project, the quality durability of the end result, and the probability of economic development to mitigate the expenses. So for the February 4th community meeting, um, Dr. Schiller, and you might remember that, that's, you can watch it on tape at Mary Ellen Henderson, Dr. Schiller and Wyatt Shields presented three options because they determined that um, some of the five were very similar um, in nature. The option number one, which was a minimal renovation and an addition, and that would take from 2018 to 2021. Option two was a, a new building to be constructed in two phases between 2018 and 2029, so an 11-year horizon. The first phase would be science labs, labs, art classroom, shared space, and auditorium completed in 2021, and the second would be completed in 2029. And the third option was to build a brand new building constructed at one time that would happen between 2018 and 2021. Um, as I understand it, the community consensus coming out of that meeting at Mary Ellen Henderson that day was to really look at option three, which was to build the new building um, and construct it in one phase. It would be the best idea because it would be less expensive. And then Dr. Schiller got to work thinking about how to build potentially a new academic wing and wondered if it would be practical at that point to save some of the parts of it to use as a central office, um, Mary Ellen Henderson swing space, and athletics. And he came up with the idea also with an eye to reducing costs of continuing to use a portion of the building. Um, in shorthand, some of you might have referred to it as the save the gym option. It might sound familiar to you. Um, reusing academic, uh, athletic square footage, not adding a competition gym, which is 100,000 square feet, reusing maintenance space of 9,400 square feet, food service of 12,500 12, square feet, and then taking the central office and the Mary Ellen Henderson swing space and addition out of the equation altogether. Um, based on those square footage reductions alone, Bob Jones from Arcadis went back and came up with a 60 to $70 million solution. So some key points to sort of consider in that. The price did not include a future addition and wouldn't upgrade the gyms and it wouldn't do it for at least 10 to 15 years. And at the, at the point the rest of the school would have been knocked down and available for commercial, um, the cost that had been added would bring us back to more than $100 million in cost, um, looking at doing all of that. So if you look at um, Nick Benton's article that came out um, February 8th, uh, 2017, it does give a little bit further context. So at that point, Dr. Schiller's recommendation and the school board voted to do that true feasibility study that Perkins Eastman was contracted for, just to see what was possible and potential there. Um, and if you look at the minutes at the end of the feasibility study on page 132 to 143, you see 
that um, this option of looking at the Schiller model was pretty vigorously pursued. Um, there were tours of George Mason High School with Perkins Eastman uh, at the start of their contract. They walked the lines to determine what the saved option, save the gym option would keep and what would go, come down. And in the May 4th minutes in that same document, item, item 2.14, Dr. Schiller said that the affordability should not be undervalued. He described the benefit of the modernization approach, save the gyms, cafeteria and science labs allows for their replacement in the future once economic development and funding is available. Well, Perkins Eastman went back and took a deeper dive into all of that and determined um, while it potentially could happen, it would actually cost more than $60 million in the end. Um, by saving a portion of the school would require upgrading the systems in that portion. That was not part of the $60 million that was put into that plan. So it would mean upgrading to ADA. It would mean bringing the, the sewer up uh, and HVAC systems up. It would include bringing up the plumbing um, and the like. The line that would be drawn that would be saved, um, according to Perkins Eastman, was so jagged and so uneven that there would be challenges to just the construction of the project and how to even attach it to what was there. Um, in addition to that, Perkins Eastman opined that there would need to be a large contingency because the issues of connect connecting the old construction um, with a new can turn out to actually be more expensive because of the way that the, the difficulty of the um, building is. Um, the area that would be saved would then eliminate also four acres to the to the economic development would eliminate four acres of the development possibility. So then it would leave a footprint of about six acres to do development. Um, and in the end, it would leave us a building that didn't have new gyms, didn't have a cafeteria that was larger, didn't have an auditorium that was any bigger. And while some of the new section would look a little bit new, we would still have this core facility that looked um, the same as it does now. Um, and would result in a very, very difficult space to navigate. And we know how important flow in a building is as well. Um, so in their um, deeper dive, Perkins Eastman did take into account the 60 to $70 million option that Dr. Schiller brought up, determined that it wasn't really feasible, but did extrapolate out from that what could it look like if we were actually going to do it. And in their extrapolation, they presented to us, as you may recall, the hybrid school and the academic school, and both of those are in the feasibility study, and those are the combination of saving a portion of the school and adding to. Both the hybrid model and the academic model are exceed the $100 million mark. So when it's all taken into account, the $100 million to do this hybrid model or to do um, the academic model and the loss of the economic development opportunity by losing a significant portion of the acres to help pay for and offset the construction costs wasn't tenable to, to you as a board, to the community, or to the city council, and that's how we ended up where we are. So, so that um, $60 million version, the long story short is, it was a nice back of the napkin idea, but when you peel the onion back to determine what actually goes into that $60 million, it, it, we have to upgrade ADA, we have to upgrade HVAC, we have to create a space that kids can flow through, we have to create an environment that's conducive to learning, and that 60 to $70 million version just doesn't do it. <coughs> I know it's a long answer, um, but my, you know, I had to go back and piece some parts together, and that's sort of where I landed. All right, well, so the, Mr. Quave said, you know, 50, maybe 70, but, but clearly those numbers do not align with the ultimate cost, which would be north of 100 million. Correct. That is correct. And the $120 million model, which you have adopted, the community school, is the all-in model. The other piece that's not, that was not accounted for in here was no FF&E, no engineering, no design, which is another 20% on the cost. So on a $60 million, um, not that's an extra 12 million dollars so or on a 70 million we're looking at 14 more so it's really the 70 million is really an 84 million and you still don't have the infrastructure that's necessary um, so the 120 that we're looking at with the potential bond referendum would be engineering would be architecture would be all the design work it would be all the FF and E um, and it's the it's the all-in number thank you that's very helpful any other questions for the superintendent? All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
we will move on to board and student liaison comments and we'll start with Ms. Gill. Ms. Gill do you um, I don't have anything for the committees that I am a liaison to but the elementary PTA is having um, the fall carnival this weekend and they are woefully short of volunteers. I am volunteering. I'm running the cakewalk. Um, and if anybody else, I'm there. But if anybody else would like to volunteer, um, MEH students and GM students can volunteer. So if you have a student who might want to come and help out at the elementary spring carnival or fall carnival, um, that would be fantastic. Thanks. Mr. Ankuma. Uh, band boosters, we met band for the, at the beginning of the year, but we were sort of developing programs and uh, deciding where the kids will go this year. It's a bit of a, a hard act to follow after the Carnegie Hall last year, so that was a, but we're still working on that. Um, FCE, PTA, well, that was the joint session where you spoke, so that was our, that, that took the place of our first meeting. The uh, most interesting thing I did was uh, represent the board at the VSBA Legislative Conference um, in Charlottesville the other day and uh, heard from both uh, candidates for governor um, on their their educational uh, should I say <laughs> uh, ideas let's put it this way uh, Mr. Gillespie was there in person Mr. Northam uh, spoke to us by video um, but what actually what I found and they they made their pitch so uh, I'll leave that I'll leave it at that each made their own pitch but the most important thing, uh, the most interesting thing I found was um, I listened to was a presentation actually it was more of a panel by uh, a number of people, someone from the Virginia Department of Education, but a, a professor at Radford University, and, and the topic was teacher shortage across the, the state. So there's a lady from Radford University who has an interesting program and starting to begin recruiting at the high school level into a program that actually encourages them with scholarships to, to, to come into teaching or to come into a four-year education program to become a teacher right out of high school. I mean, to go to Radford. So that was interesting. Something I thought I'd mention to you. And and, and, your, and we do the Curry Fellow um, for for the University of Virginia. We have a, a teacher right now in our system who's a not a full-fledged teacher. So he's going to college right now, but we are guaranteeing her a position in our system when she when she finishes. So we, we believe in the pipeline. Thank you. Because mm. I, I thought I'd, I'd bring that up, but that was very interesting to to know that. The, it has to start early and sort of find out who's interested and encourage them to come to that. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. Thank you. Ms. Okay. Ward? Okay. Um, yeah, Daycare Advisory Board, not too much new to report there. Um, we just, um, we are appointing a new member, so we have a full, full uh, committee now. Um, uh, the Gifted and Talented Committee, however, is in need of members, so if anyone is interested, please um, let me know or go through Marty Goodell and uh, put your application in. Thank you. Mr. Castillo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, had a good meeting, kickoff meeting with the BIE with uh, Dr. Noonan there, and there's a great deal of enthusiasm as well as a desire to align the work of the BIE with our uh, triennial plan and our work plan. And in fact, we're going to have a meeting on October 26th to sort of follow up. Uh, it's it's a, a non-regularly scheduled meeting. It's going to be sort of a work session to try to figure out what that kind of support would look like with respect to alignment to our goals. I was out of town last week, so was unable to go to the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee, uh, and then was at the joint meeting of the PTAs where two Two of the PTAs voted unanimously, and one minus one voted unanimously in support of the bond referendum, which was which was good to see. And Dr. Noonan did a did a great job, along with uh, Mr. Shields, uh, presenting the the facts about what was being proposed. And uh, it was a good meeting and well attended. Thank you very much, Mr. Holmes. Um, uh, Okay, so the first thing is um, two teachers approached me about um, two weeks ago, um, and they were wondering why do we post our jobs later than Arlington and Fairfax. One of them even said we we're getting, quote, the last in the crop. Um, so that's one thing. Um, also, teachers cannot update their Macs. Um, uh, that's another thing, and I'm... Uh, proud to announce the opening of our makerspace and what is this going to be is it's going to be a center where students can uh, 
a center that students can utilize for classroom projects. So there's a 3D printer in there, there's high performance computers in there, there's um, different tools that students can use. Um, also, uh, the club fair and service fair. I was at the club fair rep uh, representing the diversity improvement project. Um, and the service felt fair went well, except there was a problem with our servers. Um, but we got that fixed. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I've been traveling a fair amount lately, and I was unable to make the either the first SEAC meeting or the first LEAP committee meeting, but I should make the next ones. Uh, the um, I was also with most of you at the P joint PTA meeting. Um, the the biweekly economic development meetings, which is sort of the follow-on activity to the one that um, Michael and uh, Aaron and John and <laughs> Lawrence all did um, for the school planning is still continuing on a, on a biweekly basis. So we, we met last week. Um, nothing really there to report other than discussions are continuing, um, and especially with the consultant Alvarez and Marcel. Um, the uh, it's a little in advance, but let everybody know that the George Mason musical um, will start on the 15th of November, I believe, Thursday. Um, and this year it is spam a lot. So for those of you who are Monty Python fans, which better be everybody, um, <laughs> you should come because if you're not a Monty Python fan, it's a great deficiency of character. Um, uh, the last thing is um, I, I raised a point after discussing it with uh, Lawrence and Peter at the agenda meeting last week that it might be a good idea because you know while there's a lot of material out there on the school referendum that perhaps more outlets are better and so like as was done at the fall festival it might make some sense to have a pavilion or just a couple of people sitting on a Saturday or two at the farmers market um, to answer questions so I haven't heard back anything on that but um, I will certainly let the board know if that opportunity presents itself. That would not be a, an advocacy situation. It would be just to put the materials out there and answer people's questions um, from our perspective. Thank you very much. Um, and in that way, I attended the uh, elementary PTA ice cream social over at TJ, I guess, what, a week, a week ago? Uh, and I, myself and uh, Ms. Conley and Ms. Hardy uh, did that very thing. We had the the board set up and uh, the the uh, one pager and and just answered questions for folks that were there uh, who had questions about the the referendum and uh, it was a decent number of folks who uh, had questions. There's surprisingly a lot of folks who are just really focusing in on this and that. I guess a person who's been involved with it for as many years now, it kind of surprises me, but uh, there are still folks who are just starting to tune in and asking questions about the uh, upcoming referendum. So it was good that um, folks were there to do that. And I think the farmer's market is another good venue to be able to uh, to do that at. And I would encourage, uh, once we kind of figure that out, being able to do that, uh, at least being able to, to answer questions for, for folks. Uh, then also, just on a personal note, just some I told, but um, I was recently appointed by the governor to serve on the, get the name correct, Commission on the Diversity, um, Equality, and Inclusion, which is the commission that um, Governor McAuliffe um, created via the executive order uh, in response to the uh, to the violence that happened in Charlottesville a few months ago. So. Um, I was uh, recently appointed to to serve on that that group and was quite honored by the governor asking me to serve on that. So um, just to kind of share that, that's a, an additional something that I have on my plate to do in addition to my my work here with the board. But uh, it's a great honor and very important topic and for us to to work at work on and come up with some solutions to uh, some of those issues. Um, are there any other? comments or anything yes sir just to um, I want to thank mr. Holmes for bringing up a couple of questions um, you know the, the posting of the jobs uh, I'm gonna ask uh, miss Hyde to sort of respond to that so we can 
take care of that? Um, we actually post positions as they we receive resignations. Um, because we are a small school division, typically it is after the budget that we actually um, offer the positions and hire for them. Um, we do go recruit um, at in February at universities, surrounding universities, and get um, applicants that would be you know, first, first out of college, um, and a lot of them end up wanting to work in Falls Church and they haven't found a job. And so I, I know that may be what teachers are sharing with you, but we get really strong teachers on um, people. Some of our new teachers come from universities that are reputable, as well as we get teachers who sometimes move from other divisions who have 14 and 15 years of experience. Um, so we, we do get strong teachers. We're not getting the bottom of the barrel, believe me. <laughs> just to, to follow up on that just briefly, not to look overly defensive about this. <laughs> um, We're not getting the we, we, uh <laughs> We did put in the triennial plan this year, and you might remember seeing it about recruiting and recruiting for diversity as well. Um, one of the things I'll, I'll be talking with our HR folks about in the coming recruiting and hiring season is identifying those areas which are critical shortage areas. Um, not that not all of them are critical shortage areas to your point, Mr. Hankuma, you know, about the t national teacher shortage, but um, particular areas such as higher level mathematics, high higher level science, um, even special ed um, and others to see if there's a way that we might even be able to offer early hire contracts uh, and what that might look like. So if we found a really great candidate in March, we could, uh, through a recruiting fair, offer that person on the spot a, a potential contract um, not for a position of their choosing, but when they come, we can say, you got a position here, let's help you find the best one. But we can capture them early so that we don't have to wait on, uh, wait on the hiring season. So anyway, just. Mr. Nkuma? Thank and you. One, sorry. Absolutely, good questions. Uh, there was one more, one more task, um, or should I say one more liaison assignment. That was the special education. Uh, we had our first meeting, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Noonan for offering to attend, and uh, we leveraged his background in special education and special expertise. Uh, the committee's quite excited. It was quite excited to have him there to share his um, ideas and know that they have a superintendent who's really backing them. We've also gotten two new members whom I met, and uh, I, highly, I highly recommend. So I've given that to Ms. Marty to get them approved, and I think we approved them earlier. Actually, we approved them as part of the, okay, so that's good. Thank you, Peter. Any other questions or comments? If not, uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you.